Welcome to the World Championship Air Race Podcast, giving you the behind the scenes look into the World Championship Air Race. My name is Alex MacPhail, and I'll be chatting to guests from the air racing community all around the world. Make sure to subscribe on your podcast platform to keep up to date with our latest releases. Now fasten your seatbelts, prepare for takeoff, and let's get airborne. Well, good afternoon to you and welcome to the World Championship Air Race Podcast, episode number two. A very distinguished guest with me today, Matt Hall, the current reigning world champion for the last series of the Red Bull Air Races. 2019 champion, Matt Hall, welcome to you. Thank you for your time and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks, Matt. Uh, it's good to be on it. Nice. You did say a moment ago that you were flying today. Tell me, what were you flying this morning or this afternoon? Uh, just out in the extra doing uh, a few uh, a few things there. We uh, were away for the weekend and it had a few uh, things that needed to be addressed, so did a little bit of work on it, just a quick test flight on it. Okay. Did you manage to work in a bit of high G work as well? Uh, the, it's the 300L, so uh, it doesn't go above 10G, so we can't really call it high G then. <laughs> Okay, so if it's not above 10, it's not high G. Well, from my uh, limited background with G, we were restricted to 7G on the Pilatus Astra in the South African Air Force. And uh, 7G was quite a workout for me with a G suit on. And watching all these clips recently and myself, I've just been recently started to fly an extra as well. Without a G suit, I feel a bit naked. Uh, what, what is your experience coming from the fast jet fighters, G suit, all that, to flying competition aerobatics and racing and no G suit? Um, it, it never really worried me too much because I was already doing competition stuff uh, while I was in the military, so uh, it was it was a bit of a bit of a hobby at that point. And uh, I actually really enjoyed the freedom of being able to just jump in and go flying. Um, you know, I, I deliberately didn't wear a helmet uh, when I first started doing the aerobatics. I, you know, just because I enjoyed just the the freedom of not being uh, not being, you know, uh, you know, so part of the aircraft is just like being free in the aircraft. Yeah, I must say I had a, um, well, I'll have to talk about this one off air, but I had an incident as well where I also didn't have the helmet with me. We operate a light aircraft with a helmet because of the low level operations and the turbulence and it feels very different to not wear what you're accustomed to. Uh, so yeah, th this I recently have myself jumping in without a G-suit. It just felt very strange, but uh, for you, obviously, it, it's it's come a long way. Yeah, yeah. Well, since uh, when, I first, um, when I first started doing you know, casual aerobatics with with a pair of sunnies and a headset um, and a t-shirt. Obviously now when I am racing, I've got, um, yeah, well, even when I'm doing display, I've got uh, yeah, everything, every part of my face and my body is covered apart from just across the uh, the face uh, for both fire protection, for bailout protection, for uh, just the roll rates at 400 degrees a second, uh, head protection against the canopy. So um, yeah, we, uh, I'm now basically back to where I was in the, um, in the Air Force uh, apart from G-suits. And obviously we did wear G-suits for a while there when we were racing as well. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been through the whole time. Oh, you, you did. That was my next yeah, question. No, okay. So how long did the G suit season last on the racing? Uh, we wore G suits, um, 2009, 2010, 2014, and maybe 2015. I can't recall when they were phased out, but yeah, we, we did probably three seasons of wearing G suits. Um, but they, um, the pilots kind of voted them out. Uh, because they were um, they were detrimental actually they didn't help they uh, they hindered our g tolerance um, uh, because our g duration is such a small window um, the the um, but hydration and fatigue is a huge consideration for when you're doing short duration high g it's all about the uh, the fatigue and the hydration in the body when you're wearing a g suit which was a full body suit uh, fluid suit actually. Um, you, all the pilots were finding that they were uh, yeah, fatigued from putting it on and taking it off, plus the heat stress involved in uh, wearing it meant that uh, the G times was actually decreasing um, at the, towards the end of the day versus staying uh, staying neutral during the day. Oh, that's interesting. I've never considered that. And so, did you say it was a full G suit uh, top and pants in the racing as well? It was a lapel suit, so uh, it was part of the flying suit, which had fluid channels in it. Um, and then it was uh, zipped up to tighten it down to the body, but uh, the, the fluid started from the shoulders all the way down on uh, front and back down to uh, the ankles. 
Okay. Well, all right. So uh, voted out a bit like the airline pilots who vote out the, the thing about the, the legacy airlines. They wear the caps and uh, half the pilots like it and half the pilots don't like it. And there's often a vote. Are we going to wear caps? Are we not going to wear caps? <laughs> Similar kind of thing. So the pilots voted out, but on a, on a more technical matter rather than personal preference or you know, what do you look like? But now we've, we've dug right into the weeds here. I just want to uh, dig about it a little longer before we back up. But uh, in terms of G tolerance, so last year must have been interesting. What was the longest stretch where you didn't fly and you wouldn't have had G? Um, well, I guess we're pretty fortunate being in Australia that uh, we didn't really have any, uh, where I live, we didn't have any, any lockdowns. You know, there's been a few lockdowns um, you know, in Melbourne and in Brisbane and Adelaide. But um, where I live, um, basically we're advised don't go to work unless it's essential. Um, and uh, we were running an essential service uh, with doing charter with, with uh, some of our other larger aircraft, with our King Air. Uh, so I was quite often at work and flying. Um, and then if I was at flying, I figured what better way to uh, self-isolate than get in a single-seat race plane and go for a flight. Okay, all right. So there was no long period where you didn't do some G? No, no, probably longest duration was probably uh, three weeks where I didn't pull G, so that was all right. <laughs> okay, for those who are not really so familiar with it, it, it is something that you build up tolerance to, but it is also something that you can't really practice for. You can get strength and you can get toned and get ready for it, but the actual experience of G is not something you can really simulate too easily. So this is something you need to keep doing repetitively, a bit like rugby players, professional rugby players. They need to take those hits, those sort of high-impact contacts, and it doesn't matter how much you gym, you can't simulate that. And uh, I don't know, maybe you could uh, try and describe for the listeners what that feels like or what it what it is to stay G fit or to build G fitness, and uh, and after that we'll we'll backpedal a bit to some of your background and your formative years. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess G, it's um, yeah, it is something that your body adapts to. Um, uh, you know, I've been pulling high G now for just thirty years, um, and uh, your body does uh, get used to doing it. It um, uh, yeah, it has it has very good training and reaction that. Uh, um, you've got uh, sensors in the back of your neck which actually pick up um, uh, your blood pressure going to your brain and they become tuned to what's going on with your body and uh, yeah, as it turns out, the, the longer you do it for a career, the uh, more attuned they get. So if I have any drop in blood pressure at all in, um, in the baroreceptors in the back of my neck, uh, of my instantaneous reaction uncontrolled is that uh, my heart rate increases, all of my uh, lower arteries contract to keep the, the blood up towards my head, which is a natural reaction to passing out, but my body just reacts to it very, very quickly. So, um, you know, I can pretty comfortably sit at 8G without G straining uh, for long duration um, because my body wow. just naturally deals with it. And it's only when I'm going up above 8G I have to start actually doing uh, G straining. And uh, G straining, um, you know, while, yeah, you need to get in the plane to do it and, and, and be current, um, you can do you know, 80% of it's actually um, being fit and healthy and uh, with the correct muscle mm -hmm. groups, uh, key in, so core strength, uh, thigh strength, calf strength. Um, so working on those items all the time and you can actually maintain a pretty good G tolerance uh, without even being in the aircraft. Sure. Okay. So uh, just to really make it a bit simpler for the, the basic listener out there. So essentially what's happening is the, the blood is draining away from your head. And the, and you and your your uh, um, what is required of you is to try and keep the blood there. And in order to do that, you tense up all the big muscles, starting with your thighs and your buttocks and your your core, as you mentioned, all those. But the real goal there is to take a bit of strain on your body to keep the blood up high. Now, one of the things that counts against someone like me, you have a look from the side here. I've got quite a, quite a long distance from my brain to my heart, and, and the, apparently the longer the distance from the brain to the heart, the worse naturally your natural ability of, of uh, resistance to G is, is decreased. So the shorter people that have a shorter distance between brain and heart are able to naturally withstand G. But obviously we're talking about uh, you know the instantaneous part, and, and you can work and build up towards this. I mean, to be able to sustain 8G that, uh, without straining, that's quite impressive. That, uh, at what point then do you start the strain, though, even though you're able to go up to 8G? Do you, if it's an easy turn, do you not bother, or do you put on the strain anyway? Uh, it, depends on, it depends on how I'm feeling on the day. Uh, I do always do a G warm at, uh, for every flight, unless I'm doing a, you know, a display entry from takeoff or a race from takeoff. So, yeah, I'll do, a, I'll do an unstrained 5G turn um, for my G warm and then assess my visual cues. 
if I'm starting to get some sort of uh, visual degradation, I will start a G-strain and push it back out again. Um, that will then um, affect my body's posture for G and mean that my, my body's natural G tolerance is already elevated. Um, if I do a G strain, a, a G warm at 5G and I get no reaction, I'll actually then continue to pull until I do get a visual cue so that I've at least triggered the natural response of my body, but then I'll also know that I'm pretty good for G that day. Um, so it's my assessment, and then if I've had a bad day, everything's going as I'm going through 4G, I'm going to strain every time above 4G. Okay, and also obviously by now you've also quite comfortable what that feels like. So you can pull on five Gs and hold it there, knowing without looking at a G meter that that's about five Gs. That's also something you get comfortable with. Yeah, I reckon if you talk to any of the race pilots, uh, yeah, we're we're pretty comfortable judging within point two, point three of a G just by feel uh, up to eleven G. Wow, <laughs> that's wow, that's quite impressive. Well, it's something that you're dealing with all the time, and I suppose that's the the race craft and all the the bits and pieces of the high performance team. You have to operate right on the margin. Thanks. That was quite a nice deep dive on G and G tolerance and fitness. But if we can now, Matt, if we can just uh, backpedal a little bit and let's go back to sort of formative years. I know you started gliding as a youth and uh, before joining the, the military. So maybe just talk me through your journey as to, to what it was. Uh, I, I know you met an older gentleman who was a Spitfire pilot and you had a very endearing story about how he looked at you with sort of a longing that, you know, if he was in your shoes now, he would just really dive at this with both hands and, and say, this is, this is my opportunity. What, look what lies ahead. And I know, you know, fellow pilots, we look at Spitfires and, and guys who flew Spitfires and we think very romantically about if I only flew in that time, the golden age of flying. But what was your sort of formative experience of uh, where it all started and how you, you saw this as a possibility to join the Air Force and become a professional pilot? Um, yeah, so I started flying as a, as a, a very young person with my dad. Um, uh, he was an Italian gliders. That, that was his, that was his uh, way to, to get free flying. So I would, I would uh, ride in an old Oster, going up and down with him. And um, I started gliding when I was a teenager. And, uh, you know, throughout school, uh, continued to fly gliders and then ultralights and a bit of hang gliding as well. Um, and I wanted to join the Air Force, but uh, there, there were um, certain certain uh, recommendations that uh, it may not be for me. It may not have been the, the direction I should go in. Um, but uh, yeah, as you say, I met a. I was fortunate to meet a, a World War II Spitfire pilot, who um, basically just put in my head that he'd give anything to be in my position right now, so that um, so that he could have the opportunity to go and fly these supersonic jet fighters. And uh, it, it took me a little bit to figure out what he was saying. Yeah, a couple, only a couple of hours. But uh, yeah, basically, what he was saying is that uh, you know I've got what he wants. Why the hell aren't I using it? And, um, and it occurred to me that um, you know, potential doesn't last forever. If you've got potential and opportunity that uh, line up, you've got to grab it because um, when they separate, you're never going to see them again. So uh, I've lived my life basically on that uh, philosophy ever since that uh, you know, always invest in yourself, always increase your own potential so that when an opportunity saddles up next year, you can look at it and go, you reckon I can uh, jump onto that opportunity and ride it and, uh, and never give up. Oh, that's great. This uh, lining up potential and opportunity. And that is, uh, I think a lot of people see that in life and they're just either unsure, unconfident or, or not, n not know which step to put in place to be able to go for it. So, uh, you know, success stories are often built on, well, there was a gap and I was ready and then we just, we went for it. And you don't always know what the answer is. But I mean, my motto as well is you just got to start, you know, you can course correct as you go, but you got to start, you got to give this a go. And, and in fact, most high achievers and, and people that become successful in life, they didn't, they didn't know what it was to begin with either. And here's another example. So if you, if you dive into the military, then was it clear right away that you're going to be a fast jet pilot or how did this sort of streaming or your application for which line you'd end up in? Because you could get streamed into transport helicopters or fighters. How did you end up in the, in the fighter line? Um, well, basically, uh, you just join the Air Force as you know, a potential pilot. And uh, I went through what's called a direct entry scheme. So there was no degree or no academy. I basically um, started flying 13 weeks after joining, you know, signing on the line. And, uh, and then really, it's just, um, you know, uh, you, you go through to get your wings. And uh, there's no streaming until you've got your wings, which is about 18 months later. And then uh, all they do is uh, they ask everybody, what do they want to fly? And the bet he did on course, the you know, um, you get your choice. Um, so I was I was the uh, the top of my class, and um, you know, I obviously said I want to fly fighters, and uh, and got that uh, got that gig, which was lucky because I was the only guy of my class that was offered offered fighters uh, oh, at wow. that particular time. So 
Um, I was um, you know, streamed off at uh, right uh, when they pinned my wings on, streamed off, off I go, fly, uh, fly fighters for my career. Nice. Okay. I mean, it seems to also be a common theme around Air Force is that you, the, the, obviously the, the top get to go where they want to go, but also the lowest number end up in the fighter line. Obviously, there's limitations, there's cost of training, and they want to get the best of the best, and they want to you know, develop the talent that's there. So you, you walk through the journey there, and you, you spend a long time in the fight line. Uh, 20 years in the military is a, is a, a longish career. Uh, where did you end up? Were you a squadron boss, or what was your sort of senior role there just as you were leaving the military? Um, I was a wing commander when I left, um, um, and I wasn't uh, the boss of a squadron at the time. I was in a, a flying staff job at the uh, at the group um, that runs all of the fighter squadrons at uh, our home base at Williamtown and uh, up in Tyndall. And um, but I was I was pretty much uh, for that last uh, year I was on um, part time leave um, and and long service leave sort of coming into work for a few weeks and then leaving again because that's when i was um <laughs> doing my training for um entering into the red bull air race okay all right well that's a good transition to the air races then matt so uh i mean it is a nice long career and it's and it's it's hard on the body and you got to keep sharp i mean a, a fighter pilot day one or the last day after 20 years you have to be as sharp as you were in the first day there's no reprieve for a fighter pilot so you've now transitioning yourself in managing to you know, work a bit of time into your schedule to, to get flying little aircraft again, race planes. What did that look like to you? Was there already an interview process or, or what was that last year? How did you know it was going to work out for you? How did it work out for you to get into the Red Bull Air Race Series? Yeah, I didn't know if it was going to work out or not. Uh, you know, it was a bit of a roll of the dice, uh, very similar to the situation I just mentioned with, um, with the Spitfire pilot for joining the Air Force. Uh, nothing's guaranteed in life, but yeah, you, when you see your own potential, and you believe in your own potential and you see an opportunity, um, what you've got to do is you've got to project yourself five years forward and go, how am I going to feel if I didn't actually grab this opportunity and give it a, give it a shake? And so that was exactly what happened. So I had to take that long service leave from the Air Force. Um, the training was expensive. We had to mortgage the house to, uh, to pay for the training because uh, the training was in Europe and I had to go over there uh, on a regular basis for a year from Australia to, um, to do the training. Uh, as I say, with no guarantee of success, and um, mm. there was uh, there were certain requirements we had to meet um, for the training and in being involved in international competition, aerobatic competition at unlimited level, um, and then also uh, being invited to a rookie camp to fly through pylons um, and do some race training. Um, and even at that point, successful on both of those fields is once again still no guarantee. So. Basically, I had to wait another couple of months to find out if I was uh, successful to uh, to get a position on the Red Bull Air Race. And uh, during that time, uh, yeah, it was, it was reasonably stressful. You know, I was uh, I was raising a young family, had a had a six month old kid. Um, I was uh, was spent my whole time on the road in Europe training, and uh, had mortgaged the house with a you know, a massive debt against it for that training. And uh, you know, fingers crossed it's going to work out, which yeah, it did. And uh, would I do it again? You bet. Um, yeah, would I take that risk again? You bet. And um, yeah, you'd rather. You, you, I always say you'd rather you'd rather die knowing you gave it gave it a shot, than uh, wondering if you could have done something different in your life. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And did, when you when you spent that time and money in Europe, did you was your family with you, or were you doing the shuttling up and down for weeks at a time? I was doing shuttling. So yeah, I was basically. Uh, I would um, I would travel to Europe, which takes um, about forty eight hours from Australia. I'd then spend about mm -hmm. nine days in Europe training. I'd fly back home again. I'd spend seven days at home, and then fly back to Europe again. And I did that for about eight months. Wow. Yeah, that's hard going. I mean, uh, in one respect, it's great that you have this opportunity to focus. You go all in once you're there. You, you can semi switch off, but in the same respect, switching off to home means you you got this disconnect. And getting home is this like the switch, this sort of polarity on and off, on and off. You know. You met the race pilot and met the family man, met the race pilot, met the family. Not an easy time and obviously a very supportive family to help you get through that uh, that journey. Yeah, sure. Like it, uh, it couldn't happen without uh, family support, that's for sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that when people say, if anyone ever calls me lucky that I'm, I'm a race pilot, it's like, uh, yeah, there wasn't a lot of luck involved. I'm fortunate I'm a race pilot, but I worked bloody hard for it, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, sure. And just curious now, obviously, there's a lot of cost operating airplanes, there's cost flying to Europe and back. But was there like an application fee as well? Or was it purely that the training cost a lot of money to operate the, these aircraft? Uh, there's no application fee. Uh, the mainly, the mainly the costs for me were, um, were the airline travel costs um, and uh, the lack of 
the lack of income because I was taking I was, I was taking leave without pay at times because I didn't have enough leave saved up to to cover an eight month period with, uh, with no income. So um, loss of income, uh, you know, two thousand you know, two to three thousand dollar return airfare every time because it's a long way. Um, you know, all the transport mm-hmm. costs. Um, you know, doing that for uh, eight months it, uh, it really took its toll on everything. It does add up, yeah. But uh, as you said earlier on, you like to invest in yourself, so there's a clear investment, both in time, you know, effort, money, etc. So, what was the time, the, the sort of time period then? You you spent this eight months on and off. Did you transition then out of the military, re- sort of retire, and then have a spot right away, or was there another sort of lull where you had to figure things out? No, no. Uh, the day the day I actually had my last day in the in the military, so I put my resignation in, and the day I had my last. Um, payday in the military was the 17th of January 2009 and on that particular day I was in Salzburg signing a contract to uh, to race planes in the Herbal Air Race so I didn't actually have a single day uh, unemployed even though I was self-employed <laughs> at that point uh, but yeah I had a contract uh, leaving the Air Force on the same day I signed my race contract so it was a uh, it was it was just it wasn't planned that way it just worked out that way. Eight months of hard work and uh, and sacrifice paid off, and uh, obviously it's up until that point very nerve wracking. But you must have been super relieved to be doing, you know, concurrently being able to move out of one thing and into the next. Did, was there consideration to move your family to Europe at that point? There was. Uh, we did have we had that discussion, but um, uh, it was encouraged actually by the air race for me to stay in Australia because. They wanted an Australian pilot to then be in Australia and do Australian media and and rally the Australian public sure. behind the uh, the race, um, which yeah I understood. And you know also um, you know I, I love my country and uh, yeah there would have been financial benefits for moving overseas for sure. Uh, but uh, I do love being uh, in Australia and um, and you know with extended family and all that sort of stuff. It was uh, it was definitely where we we're going to stay. Okay, that's great. All right. So now, now talk me through this next journey then. So you, you signed the contract, you've resigned from the, the military, and now the new journey begins and you all of a sudden become the boss, the CEO, the brand manager, the athlete, the pilot, the tactician. Uh, you, I mean, you've got your team, but essentially everything's falling on your shoulders. What is, what is that sort of feeling in, in your life? Uh, how, how are you coping? How are you managing? I mean, there's a lot of excitement in the air, but there's also a lot of loose parts now that you've got to keep together. Definitely, there's uh, you yeah, know became a, a busy a busy period in my life. Um, yeah, fortunately, I'd already you know I'd grown up being a busy person, being uh, yeah military you yeah, know fighter pilot and uh, you yeah, uh, yeah, running our own Top Gun school etc. So I, I was used to high workload and I was used to being you know uh, having to manage things aggressively and how to maintain um, you yeah, know flight safety and uh, and pretty much that's really what we put it down to in the end was. Um, how to survive the year was the first key for the first year. Um, and we, we basically selected three items to focus on. Uh, and none of them r- related to results. Um, it, was, it was purely uh, healthy. I had to be healthy physically and mentally to do it. We had to have a safe aircraft um, that was always, you know, always serviceable and always safe. It didn't have to be fast, just serviceable and safe. And uh, the third one was don't go bankrupt, which is a huge thing in aviation, obviously. Uh, it's very easy to outspend your earnings, and um, and there's no point doing it if you end up bankrupt and you can't do it anymore. And oh, by the way, you no longer have a house. So um, they were the three things we concentrated on, and uh, by keeping it that simple, we actually had a good year. Okay, so what did your that first team look like, and and how does that differ to what your team will look like, uh, you know, in 2019 or 2022 next year? With similar size, similar kind of people. Are the same people in your team? Oh, it. Uh, I guess it was a different. It was a different era. Um, in that first year, I didn't even own my own race plane. You know, I was renting a race plane from Steve Jones. Um, the team were part timers. Uh, you know, they were contractors that just came in to race and and left again. Um, and it was only a three man team. Um, I didn't have any employees at all, actually. Uh, whereas uh, in two thousand nineteen, when we finished up the team. I think uh, in the Japanese race we had a team of six people, um, four of which were full time, um, and uh, that's just for the race team. And I also had my my company back home, which had another another three full time employees as well. So you know it's um, it's a completely different animal now. Um, you know, obviously, I've, and I own two race planes. We've got one at home for development and one on the road for uh, for racing. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a completely different animal to uh, two thousand nine. That's for sure. 
Okay, but it's very encouraging and exciting to hear that you could rent an aircraft and have a, a bunch of part-timers and still participate in something as top flight as the Red Bull Air Race. So uh, was that common or were you the unusual person having a rented aircraft? Yeah, I was probably about the only one renting a plane, to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> but there's a world, there's a way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was uh, just one of those things. Yeah, we didn't have, yeah, we didn't have a, a lot of money left over. And um, I knew the plane I wanted. I wanted an MXS, you know, like uh, like that one up there. Um, and Steve had just purchased an MXS to race, but didn't get a contract to race on the year I was coming in. You know, unfortunately, I effectively replaced him as uh, as a race pilot. So uh, I wrote to him and said, "Yeah, what are you doing with your plane? Do you want to sell it to me? Yeah, you know, I can and come up with a with a payment schedule to to buy it off him." And uh, he basically just said, oh, "I'd actually like to keep it if I could." Do you want to rent it off me? So um, we came up with a deal, and I rented the race plane from him. And so I just paid, I paid my uh, my staff on uh, part time part time salaries to um, to turn up to races and uh, and um, be there for the race. And then that was the end of it. And we'd all go home, go our own ways, and then turn up to the next race and race again. Okay, well, I mean, again, ingenuity—you got to make it happen. And you know, not there isn't sort of one path to get anywhere even at the, the sort of top end of, of uh, uh, racing aircraft around the world. Uh, that's quite a cool story. And also, I mean, I just, my Im- immediate thoughts are, well, that's quite gentlemanly of him knowing that, A, this would be the sort of ticket for you to get in, and B, you're effectively replacing him and it's his ticket out, but that he still lets you, I know it's a business deal, but he still ba- basically gave you the opportunity to get in there. Not yeah. to qualify, but the fact that there's an aircraft now for you. Yeah, and Steve, Steve's a great bloke. Yeah, he's... Uh... He's an awesome guy, actually. I get on super well with him. Uh, you know, we've always uh, we've always got on very, very well from that first year. Uh, we still get on well, and um, yeah, he's uh, it, it, there's some people that wouldn't have worked for you know, you know either me or him. It, yeah. it wouldn't have worked, but for the two of us, uh, we had a, we had <laughs> we had a great time. Yeah, he only got, he only flew the plane once the whole time, and um, and he actually really enjoyed watching me fly the plane. Okay, well, you know, I mean, it must have been amazing for him too, knowing that his aircraft's there. He's got a bit of a, he's got some skin in the game. I want to just bring into a, a sort of a feeling, an emotion, uh, you know, a time in your life as a, as a professional pilot, I think, to my uh, going solo in the Air Force, that first flight and one circuit and, land, you know, full stop landing. Then you, uh, then you fast forward to getting your wings and then maybe your first operational conversion unit. Those are key moments, and I'm sure you, you know, those stick in your mind like they happened yesterday for yourself too. But tell me about the, the feeling and how it equates to that first race day where you're actually on the track, smoke on, it's, uh, it's you in the box. Tell me that sort of feeling. Talk me through that first, that first race for you. Uh, I, was, I was pretty focused. And, um, you know, I've I got to admit, I didn't really have this uh, euphoric feeling of it. I was just like, this is, um, this is just my job now. And um, I just focused on getting on with the job. Um, um, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, I was nervous about a month beforehand, but uh, on the race itself, I wasn't nervous because because I I had really set those three goals. You know, it's like a, um, I was not results focused at all. So as long as I achieved my three objectives for every race, um, I was relaxed, and those three objectives could be achieved before I even turned up at the race, which was you know healthy brain and healthy body, serviceable and safe aircraft, and not going bankrupt. So I'd turn up at the race going. It's all sold. I'm fit and healthy. The plane's serviceable, and uh, we've got money in the bank. Let's just enjoy the race, and uh, and that's what I did. And uh, I didn't really, uh, you know, I didn't really have a euphoric. I, I wasn't there going, man. I'm this is me. I'm I'm now a race pilot. It was like it's just. It was really just like another day at work flying an F-18. It was, yeah. Uh, you know, there's pressure on. You've got to get the job right, um, but don't worry too much about what's down the down the track. Focus on what you're doing right now, and just do a bloody good job of what you're doing right now. And uh, and when you finish the day, how'd you go? As it turned out, I did pretty well. Okay, so now tell me about that. Come on, uh, you got to let us in a little bit there. So that night, you're having a beer or a champagne or something. You got to be thinking about it. Wow, that was me. I just raced my first race. How are you feeling that night when I mean, it's all said and done? It's yeah, true that I even remember it. <laughs> I came. I came uh, fifth uh, on that first race, so I remember. I think you know, I remember almost every single result I had uh, during the air race. Um, and I came fifth at that race, um, but uh, yeah, I don't really remember uh, yeah, anything particular after the race at all. Um, I, in fact, mm, no. In fact, I do. I, I had um, I, I shouted my team for dinner and actually joined Mike Goulian and his team, and uh, and then uh, 
I said to, to Mike, yep, yeah, and we're paying. And Mike's like, really? I always get my team to pay for their own meals. I'm like, dude, you and I, we're paying for everybody here. And, uh, <laughs> good, that's a good move. <laughs> that was when Mike was looking to go, man, you're going to stop this spending the money like this. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you tick off number three, no bankruptcy, I can pay for the beers, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, you can always great. spend your money. It's easy to spend your money if you've got money in the bank, and that's always what will work on you. There's no point having too much in there. It'll just disappear in some other direction, so spend it the way you want it. Yeah, that's great. Now, your your three goals are great, and it really builds a healthy. I know it's number one goal is to stay healthy, but it builds a healthy mindset to to life and any challenges that are in front of you. Stay healthy, have a safe aircraft, and don't go bankrupt. And uh, you know, it it makes me think of you know the mantra I've been been speaking for years is high performance teams is thorough preparation, execution with precision, and then review. So you know, talk going to any event if you're a high performer going to the world stage, you get yourself ready physically, mentally. You know, just before the the game, the event, the the contest, you give your best on the on the event itself. But then also, once the event's over, the debrief. Um, I know you you talked about uh, preparation and planning and a lot of the other interviews that you've done. Uh, where does review sit for you? How do you how do you approach review? Like both right away after the event, and you've landed and you're in the hangar now, or that night or the next day. How do you approach review in your performance? Uh, in particular, racing. Racing, yes, yeah. Um, it, we're, we, we're pretty, that's probably the highest part of what we do, actually. Um, and we we have multiple layers of it, uh, huge amount of layers. Now, I won't go into too many details. Like, if I was a retired no, no, racer, I'd, can... I'd tell you go, everything go. I did. But, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, since I'm going to be racing and some of the guys will be watching this, um, I won't go into too many details, but uh, we have okay. a very a very structured and a very layered approach to, uh, to debriefing. Um um, debriefing every single flight, debriefing every day, debriefing every event, and debriefing the year. And uh, we we have formal processes that we did, uh, and timelines and responsibilities for those debrief uh, sessions. Okay, and uh, I mean, you obviously involve your team. I know you don't want to give too much away here, but um, is there anyone that has a sort of more say, a writing say? Is there anyone that you go to first? You say, okay, you. T- you Tell me it straight. That sort of approach to really like, there's no, there's no egos here. We want to fix this. We want to make it better. Or we did really well. Can we make it better? What's your sort of go-to person or approach to, to let's get to the bottom of it. That wasn't good enough. Or let's make it better. There's never a perfect flight, so there's always room for improvement. Um, even when we'd win a race, um, I'd get off the podium, and then while they were trying to hurry me up to get on the helicopter to go to the, the press interview. We would go and have a debrief uh, and talk about what we could have done better, uh, even when we win the race. And um, everyone has the same authority. Um, I wouldn't run the debrief. I designed it, but I wouldn't run it because if the team boss is running the debrief, everyone's scared to talk. Sure. So I handed that authority over to somebody else to run the debrief. It was via my structure, um, but I spoke as the pilot, not as the team owner. Um, the pilot, I think, should have a very large say up front to say, how did it feel? What did I see? How did it feel? How did it smell? How did it sound? And that's the raw emotion right after you're out of the aircraft. And then that gives everybody else a gut feel of what they're trying to solve. If I get out and go, the plane was shaking like hell and it was vibrating around every corner, it's going to be bloody hard for the engineer to go, plane serviceable. Yeah. So it set the scene of what did the pilot feel in the aircraft and then I would extract myself and go, that's all. That's the only input I can give until I look at, I look at the, um, the telemetry and then we would separate and everyone would look at telemetry and then we would readdress how does the telemetry relate to what the pilot was seeing and feeling and smelling. Okay, so it is, it's very technical in nature and I'm sure, you know, being within the team you – You'll be speaking in a language that only race pilots and race teams understand. But it does pique my interest. I'm curious about the sort of relationship or the friendship or the collaboration with Formula One. Has there been any of that sort of uh, leaning in on the McLaren team or, uh, you know, sharing knowledge, those ideas? Has that come across your path at all? Or the series in general, not just you? Uh, I can't talk on behalf of other teams. I'm sure there is, you know, like you'd say probably – uh, the Red Bull teams are probably using um, yeah, collaboration with, uh, with some of the Red Bull stuff. 
Uh, I was using uh, I was using some technology from um, from V8 supercars in Australia, some of the um, personal personal equipment, plus also some of the telemetry. Uh, but for my team in particular, um, my race tactician who uh, physically built the equipment and wrote the software to analyze it um, was Formula One. He was uh, Fernando Alonso's uh, race uh, tactician during the years Fernando was world champion. So he brought that uh, experience oh, wow. from being Formula One world champion. He joined my team and he said, it's been 10 years since I was a world champion. I want to be on a world championship team. What can I do to make you world champion? And we built a Formula One car in an aircraft. And you became world champion. <laughs> was he part of the team that uh, was still in uh, 2019 when you won? Certainly was. Still part of the team right now. Nice. So he feels vindicated having uh, done the job in, in two disciplines now. Uh, I'm, I'm curious again, you know, I'm fascinated by all things high performance and the high performance team of the Formula One pit lane, etc. You know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of little things to make it just that little bit better incremental gains. Was there a marked difference or was there just like a, a brushing up when you brought on this the tactician or your Fernando Alonso's tactician? Was there a step up significantly or did he just tidy your things that you were already doing? How much of an improvement was it? He came on uh, for the start of the 2014 uh, season, which was the start of round two of Red Bull Air Race. Um, there, the, the significant change we got there was that um, we already had telemetry on the aircraft prior to that, but I was doing my own analysis of the telemetry. When he came on board, he was then doing his own assessment and using smart computer software to do those assessments. Um, it took us 12 months to, you know, and there was, I would say there was, there was not a immediate result effect from that because it took us about 12 months to figure out how to use the data effectively with my natural ability and my natural sense of what's right and wrong versus his data and analysis. And um, that's, that's what a team is. You've got to learn, to, you got to learn each other's strengths and weaknesses uh, to the point where you know, in 2000, I'd probably say 2016 onwards, in 2015 onwards, um, if I said something, he could look at me and go, that's that's correct. I will find out. I will find the data to support it because it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if I said felt about like this, he'd be like, I don't think that's what's happening. And he'd go and find data to support it. And if he did that, I would listen to him. So it was the teamwork of trust on when I'm right, I'm right. But if he says he's right, where do you balance it? And that's what we became very, very good at. That I could believe something and he'd say, Matt, that's not the case. I want you to do that tomorrow. And I had to do what he said and I'd win a race. And that's pretty hard for a pilot to do. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got this gut feel going and someone's giving you insight uh, how you could do it better. Well, it's good to improve. And it's great to hear that interplay, the, the dynamic. His goal is also to win, although he's not operating the aircraft. His goal is to win just as much as it is yours. And, and he wants to give his best every time too. That's a, that's a, that's a great story. Um, if if it's all right with you, I want to to uh, really touch deep on a well touch on a, a learning experience. So can we go back to 2010 and your if you call it an accident in the water there? Um, there must have been great learning out of that. But maybe just uh, uh, talk us through the experience of it and 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 the the days and weeks afterwards. Um, yes. Yeah, so you know, obviously the experience you know, the the event you're talking about is when I um, when I uh, touched the water in Detroit. Uh, the Detroit River and uh, skipped off it and was uh, able to fly home and land the aircraft. Um, the, um, you know, in face value, if you look at it, it's, uh, you know, G-stalled the aircraft, uh, which rotated left, you know, in a left-hand turn, rotated further left, put it slightly inverted uh, when you're at, um, you know, when you're at 20 feet off the water and pulling 10 G and you're all inverted, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be close, uh, which it was. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the main... Yeah, and, and so that's, yeah, if you if you went surface level debrief, you go, don't G-stall the aircraft and it won't happen. Sure. The, what you've got to do is go, why did I G-stall the aircraft? And, uh, and that was the big thing. Um, yeah, my wife and I had a pretty big discussion. She was there when I uh, when I did it, and we had a pretty, pretty big discussion for the next uh, couple of days about uh, what sure. the future held for us. Um, you know, did we want to keep doing it? Um, did we want to keep racing? Did we want to keep uh, putting me under pressure? 
um, you know, I wasn't enjoying it at the time. And, um, and you know, a lot of the answers to that were no. Um, but once again, you had to project five years forwards and go, yeah, in five years, how am I going to feel about that decision? And, uh, and I thought I would probably feel like I'm a quitter uh, because I didn't address the problems. You know, there's problems there. There were some deep problems there. And, uh, you know, I, I, if I didn't at least try and address them, uh, that equates to me as giving up and that would then affect my sense of well-being and uh, pride for the rest of my life. So, um, so we got stuck into it. We, uh, we, we dug down deep uh, to find out why did I G-stall the aircraft. And it's, it comes down to why did I G-stall the aircraft. And um, yeah, there, was a lot, there was a lot to it, actually. There was, um, you know, it basically started at the end of 2009 when um, you know, I had a, a very successful season. 2009, my rookie year, and I came in ranked third in the world. And everyone went, yeah, you can be world champion next year. Wouldn't that be great? And I went, you know what? And I threw away those top three items of you know, healthy and safe and financially secure. And I went, let's buy a new plane. And that's when I bought the plane. Uh, let's buy the team that I've got because they're casual and bring in a full-time team. And, uh, and let's focus on results no matter what. And uh, that just changed the mentality of it. I stopped enjoying racing because if I wasn't winning, I was hating it as opposed to turning up to a race gun. I've ticked all my objectives and now I've just got to execute. Um, if you're not enjoying something, you can't be successful, um, you know, no matter how hard you try. Um, the plane, the plane was uh, unstable. It was uh, it was very fast, but it was very unstable. Uh, it was it was overweighted in the tail, um, and the professional team we ended up hiring and firing quite a few times in that year. And uh, the only person that knew all the jobs was me. So uh, here I was on that particular day, um, doing everyone's job for them as a bad leader, uh, not even thinking about my own job, and uh, took off for that race. Uh, I had a head cold, and I was taking medication for it. Um, I was chronically fatigued, uh, wasn't enjoying it, and I had done zero preparation for that particular flight because I was so busy doing everyone else's job for them. And uh, that's, uh, that led to me not flying the plane very well at all. It was already a dangerous plane to be flying in that situation. Um, and uh, I shouldn't have been in the cockpit uh, physically or mentally at that time and uh, crashed the plane. So. What it came down to is we just had to we had to fix all those problems and uh, we did and uh, the very next race I flew in I enjoyed the hell out of it the team did their job the plane was stable and we got third so okay well I mean that's a lot of stuff you mentioned you you, you clearly did a deep dive in this and unpacked everything but a lot of factors there I can think of at least four that you that you mentioned that any one of those may have resulted in a, a difficult situation I mean flying with a head cold never mind flying G's with a head cold etc. But going in with this sort of pressure, uh, one of the interviews you'd done where you were, you know, you had to change the mindset of being the CEO of the team. Now I'm the pilot. And I remember chatting with Ben Murphy last year where he said, 30 minutes before I go into bubble zone and it doesn't matter what, no one talks to me. I'm the pilot. And I'm getting myself ready. And now you spoke about preparation. So I'm curious uh, because a fighter pilot is always somewhat prepared, although he's not as, uh, as prepared as you would want to be when he says he's not prepared. But when you say you did zero preparation for that flight, are you talking about the walkthrough? Talk about what a typical preparation for a flight would look like and what you did or didn't do on that day. Um, so uh, these days, what, a, what preparation is, is uh, it starts two weeks before the race of uh, track review uh, and assessment and options and wind, wind effects, uh, heat effects, density altitude effects. Um, we turn up at the, uh, the race and then as the team owner, I then brief the team on what all of our objectives are for that race, what we've changed from last race to this race, what I think is going to happen. I then let everybody in the team have their say about what their objectives are, what we're changing, what procedures they are changing. I then formally hand over control of the team and I no longer have any input as team owner from day one of the race meet. Uh, and I become the pilot. My team manager tells me when I've got to go to places, tells me when I've, when I've got to uh, go to bed, tells me what I'm allowed to eat and when to eat. Uh, my tactician tells me what line I'm flying, how much G I'm using, what power settings and what, um, you know, and what fuel flows I'm using. I'll discuss it with him, but it's his call. My engineer will tell me what's wrong with the plane, what he's done to fix it, and what equipment is going to be purchased to do that, just so that I'm aware as the pilot what's changed. The bottom line is I have nothing to do as a team owner or team principal or team decision maker. I'm there from day one as a pilot, and it's the only safe way to do it. Um, yeah, I would sometimes be involved in meetings at higher levels with the management of the air race to discuss 
contracts, sponsorship deals, all that sort of stuff. But it's very, very controlled in a, in a very short time frame and very, very clear of race, the racing environment. On a race day... Okay, so that's... Yeah, that sounds that sounds thorough. That sounds amazing to hear. And, uh, we could dig into the weeds in those things. I just want to make sure you said uh, two weeks before you start with the track review. So when we, we, I didn't get it. When is the switchover point that you become race pilot and no longer team owner? Two weeks before? No, at, after we've arrived at the race and we have a race meeting and I run that meeting as the team owner to go, this is what we're doing. This is what I want everyone to be thinking. Where's everyone else at? Are there any problems I need to solve as a team owner? No, handing over. And then I take my team hat off and put my pilot hat on and I become a pilot. Okay, great. Now then you talked about the thorough handing over between the technician, tactician, etc. And then if you go to, it's a race day. Sorry, I interrupted you just now. Yeah. Back to race day. So on race day is really uh, just to following a routine, a very, very set routine of, um, you know, when we go, when I go to the airport, what I do when I'm at the airport, what stretches I'm doing what music I'm listening to. I listen to the same music every day when I'm on a race day so that it achieves exactly the same baseline of uh, emotions. Um, I lie down for, for a rest at a certain point before the race. I then get up, I stretch, I rehearse, I review, and it's just very, very regimented, and I make zero decisions. I'm a, I, I am, I'm a monkey at that point. I am just following exactly what we've planned and rehearsed, and I just go ahead and follow the routine. Um, and if there's a change to something, I don't look at the TVs to find out what's going on. I wait for one of my team members to tap me on the shoulder and say, Matt, the wind's changed, we're going for option B. And I'll go, and then we'll rehearse option B. And then I'm relaxed again. It's like, I don't, it's, it doesn't get any easier than that. And when you think about it, it doesn't. I'm now just sitting in the plane, yeah. I can fly the plane, I'm flying option B. Zero decisions. And when there's zero decisions, there's zero stress. Because you just go, well, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. That also reminds me of, you know, in the airline flying that, um, uh, the, the sort of safety call if you've got an engine failing the runway. This is not a decision that has taken place in the cockpit now and the engine goes bang. This was a decision taken 10 years ago when you became an airline pilot and uh, you have already briefed. When you hit that speed, if you have that problem, you know you're stopping. Or if you hit that and you're already at that speed, you know you're going. And then the bold face actions to, to neutralize and secure – so it, it, it sounds uh, thorough and, uh, and it, it is a, a winning formula of how to operate at the top level. Um, oh, I'm curious now, what music do you listen to? It's the same every time. What songs have you got? Is it upbeat stuff? Is it pop? Is it uh, classical? No, it's just uh, 80s rock, actually. Okay. Any, uh, any, any favorites in there? NXS? Did NXS, bit of ACDC, bit of Queen. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> nice to get amped up. And music definitely does that to a person. Um, okay, Matt, I want to fast forward now to next year and your thoughts on the changes from Red Bull Air Race and what you understand and know and been involved with with World Championship Air Race coming up next year. Eight or nine races, they're still finalizing all the details there. What are your thoughts on the changes to how it's going to look and feel? The, the new team with kind of mostly the same people. Uh, give me some of your, your hopes and dreams for you know, what was and what it can be coming forward. Oh, you know, it's uh, yeah, everything's an unknown at the moment. Um, I, I obviously excited. We're already putting uh, a lot of effort into it. Yeah, we've got the we've got the edge. Um, we're just putting it back together at the moment. You know, it's it's had a full tear down, a full sand back to carbon fiber, and uh, reprofile all the wings. We have fixed a lot of the things we didn't like about it because the our edge never actually came home to Australia during its race its race career. It was always on the road. So we've finally got an opportunity to get it how we want it so we we think it's going to come out a faster plane already um and we're okay. building a team we're haven't started training yet i'm physically training already so we're, we're we're very excited about getting back into it um how what do i hope is going to come out of this um you know i, I hope that this third iteration because that's what it is you know this is the third iteration um of of air racing in this format you know, it's a very recognizable format um yeah i I'm very much hoping that this this is the the final version that goes forever, and uh, you know we're on the ground floor um, with this. You know, I'm I've been doing this now for you know, thirteen, you know, twelve, thirteen years, and uh, I probably haven't got that many more years left in me. So the fact it's starting next year gives me the opportunity to to do it one more time, you know, one or two more times. You know, another couple of years would be nice to defend my title. But at the same time, 
build the team into ultimately you know the direction it really should be going which in some ways we were a bit uh tied and bound in the previous series with the the rules and the regs for uh for the business management model um this new series seems to be uh a bit more viable for turning it into a long-term business for the race team and um so i'm i'm excited both for the opportunity to defend my title as a pilot um, you know, as I say, we're making the plane faster. I'm already training, and um, but I'm also really excited for the the future potential of the sport to have it as a long term business that is uh, employs a lot of people. You know, you know Matthew Racing headquarters will be based here in Australia with uh, with a team of fifty people working on development and, um, and telemetry and uh, analysis as uh, as the sharp end of the team travel the world uh, winning trophies. That sounds good. Is that is that the projection, the fifty people, or is the team already grown up to a significant number? You mentioned six earlier. Is it is it six and with a view for fifty? Uh, the other guys, uh, the other teams are watching this. Uh, yeah, we've already got fifty people working on the race plan <laughs> and telemetry. But uh, no, we don't. <laughs> you better catch up. <laughs> That's the dream. Um, you know, like Formula One, you know, they have hundreds of people. Yeah, you know, it's probably too early to go into that yep. sort of dream. But um, you know, I, sure. you know I'd, I'd like to see that. Um, yeah, it's a it's a business that in, puts money in uh, in employees' pockets. You know, in the end, why do you run a business? It's uh, you know, it, it's actually not for your own uh, for your own benefit. It's, uh, I get a huge satisfaction out of employing people and watch them go and buy a nice car and buy a house and all that sort of stuff. And uh, if I can run a race team and travel the world and give people enjoyment and motivation while also uh, allowing uh, my employees to go and buy a nice house, um, you know, I'm I'm a pretty happy man. Well, so that you kind of answered my question. So the, the, the previous episode interview with uh, Willie Cruikshank, the race series director, he explained the differences in how we want to change this going forward. The World Champs Air Race being more like a Formula One team and a, a team can have interchangeable pilots. Not that you want to swap them all the time. You did mention a couple more seasons racing, but then it sounds to me like uh, going forward, you'll continue in this as the, you know, Frank Williams or Formula One. We met all racing and that continues maybe a decade or two on and you'll be watching from a, you know, the, the, the CEO perspective and watching the young blood come through. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's, I think, I think I'll rapidly know when the end is near for my, my actual racing because, you know, it does, it does start to hurt after a while. You know, Peter Besnier was just uh, you know, ridiculous on how long he could keep doing it for. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but, yeah, it's not just the physical side. It's the, the mental side of, you know, always trying to be on the top of your game 24-7 because, uh, you know, you've got to be sharp and you've got to be thinking the whole time. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I I do enjoy being a businessman. I, you know, I never knew that I was going to be a businessman when I was in the air force. But as it turns out, I I enjoy being a businessman. I enjoy developing stuff. You know, we've got our own maintenance company now that's doing third party maintenance. So, you know, we've got a charter company. We own a King Air. We're like, we've got we've got other things happening uh, in our in our life, and I enjoy that. Um, but the most thing I enjoy is racing planes, and it's I enjoy the development and the and the challenge of having a winning team just as much as being in the cockpit winning the race for the team. And uh, so, you know, once, once I've got the team to where I want it as the pilot, um, I'll definitely be looking to find the, uh, the right substitute and, um, and take them on board, uh, you know, for uh, John Smith to be flying for Matt Hall Racing, uh, you know, MHR probably, rather than Matt Hall Racing, was confused too much. But, you know, uh, MHR will be a team, uh, you know, going forward uh, for the next 20 years in air racing is my vision. That sounds amazing, and uh, you are a marked man as you go into the next series. People are watching you. You've, you've achieved it. You've become the world champion. It was a dream. Uh, you did well for a couple of seasons leading up to it, and then you finally won it yourself. Now, as a marked man, do you go into the season uh, any differently prepared to what you had before? I know you shaved down the plane and made it a bit faster, but does, does, what is your feeling amongst your, your colleagues and your competitors as a marked man going for it uh, back to back? Uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to, uh, to make it work. Um... You know, in some ways, the the pressure's actually gone for me. You know, I've I've actually, you know, it's uh, you know, you, you, I've talked to a lot of world champions, and they say, you know, the the second year's the hard, you know, the defending year's the harder one. Um, but um, I came so close so many times, and the pressure of not actually you know, being the bridesmaid forever uh, was huge. And uh, so I'm I'm actually a happy man at the moment. You know, I've, I've got you know I've got three of you know I've even got a couple of trophies you can't even see. So I've, I've got I've got five world championship trophies. Only one of them's gold. Um, I've got a first, three seconds, and a third. 
uh, out of eight seasons I flew for. So, um, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with, that, with those results. And as I said earlier, you can't be successful in a, especially in sport, if you're not enjoying it. And um, the pressure's off. So I'm, um, you know, I, I'm actually looking forward to uh, to getting back in there and defending the title. Um, and uh, because you know what, um, at least I will be a has been. It's better than being a hasn't been. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, Matt Hall, been wonderful chatting to you. Thanks so much for your time. Looking forward to the race series uh, starting next year and the uh, opening ceremony and everything beginning later on this year in Europe. All the best with your training and preparation, and I hope you do well to uh, retain your title next year. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me.